the main point is that for a theocracy to exist, no matter what it is, I think the government must be able, constitutionally, to both support religion and also to prefer its favorite religion over others. Um, that, and that's the way I'm using it. Um, if the government can support religion generally and also prefer one religion over others, that seems like it's getting pretty close to a theocracy, or at least the conditions of theocracy to me. But uh, this is the least sort of thought out uh, part, of the, uh, part of the talk. But the question is, are we there yet? And as of the beginning of the 2021 term, I would have said no. And I might still say no now, but it's much less clear today than it was about a year ago, which then brings us to the 21-22 term. Constitutional law uh, and law and religion, among other topics, uh, since 2001. He's the author of over three dozen uh, scholarly articles, essays, and reviews, as well as six books, including Our Non Christian Nation, How Atheists, Satanists, Pagans, and Others Are Demanding Their Rightful Place in Public Life, uh, published in 2019 by Stanford University Press. Uh, prior to teaching, Professor Professor Wexler worked as a law clerk to Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg at the U.S. Supreme Court and as an attorney advisor in the Office of Legal Counsel at the United States Department of Justice. He holds a BA from Harvard College, uh, an MA in Religious Studies from the University of Chicago, and a JD from Stanford Law School. Find him on Twitter at uh, HTTPS, uh, you know the thing, twitter.com slash SCOTUSHUMOR in all caps. All right. Sorry. And thank you for being here for our first speaker event uh, in a long time. Yeah. Hi, hi, everybody. Thanks so much for coming. Um, uh, I'm really glad this worked out that I was able to, to come speak here. I'm going um, in like three days, I'm going off for three months uh, to Asia. Uh, so I was, I was glad that I was able to push, uh, get this in before, before I leave. One of the places I'm going uh, where I'm spending six weeks uh, in Bhutan. Uh, which is at the law school in Bhutan, which of course is a, uh, a Buddhist kingdom. Uh, a Buddhist kingdom. So I'm really excited to see what that's like, um, you know, uh, because I, you know, not a, a, a big uh, supporter of, of, of religious government, but on the other hand, Bhutan has a lot of really interesting things going on. So, so I'm really excited about that. But, anyways, um, what I want to do here uh, today is focus on. What happened with respect to the Supreme Court and religion during the 21 22 term, which is now thought of as kind of the advent of the Thomas Court and the conservative supermajority uh, that we're all aware of? Um, there were some significant doctrinal legal developments that are very worrying, I think, to non Christians. And by non Christians, I mean both minority religious believers as well as secularists of all kinds. So I want to talk talk about what happened in that term and what the implications are. But to do that, I have to kind of back up a, a little bit and do a couple of prior things. So what I plan to do is to briefly describe what the law is, uh, the Constitution primarily, uh, what the law says about religion, and, and then try to set a kind of a baseline uh, by which we can measure what happened in 21, 20, 20, 21, 22 by describing briefly the state of the law before the last term, so we can understand the nature of the changes that occurred uh, uh, over, over the term. So it's a lot, I've, I've tried to push, I've put a lot into the talk, um, uh, and of course we want to save time for questions and answers, and also this ice, the ice cream thing. Uh, I can keep talking, like if, if, if the ice cream's not here yet, I can maybe <laughs> slow down or talk more. Uh, we'll make it all work. Uh, okay, so the Constitution. Uh, the First Amendment, the first sentence, says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And there are two clauses in there. There's the establishment clause, and there's the free exercise clause. The free exercise clause is about placing limits on what the government can do to restrict religious belief uh, and practice, while the establishment clause is more about placing limits on government support of religion. 
there are also, in addition to the First Amendment, a couple of statutes that are important, uh, congressional statutes. Uh, one is called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, and one is called the Religious Use and Institutional Persons Act, often referred to as RIFRA and ARLUPA. Uh, which supplement the free exercise clause a bit and give more protection to religion beyond that which the Supreme Court has, uh, has, has said applies to the free exercise clause directly. So there are these two parts of, uh, of the religion clauses, free exercise and establishment. And if we were to give a, uh, do, a, I was going to do a full description of what's going on in the Supreme Court with respect to religion, I want to talk about both sides uh, of that equation, the establishment clause and the free exercise clause. But since we don't have uh, enough time to do that, I'm going to focus mostly on the establishment clause side, because that's the side, after all, that's about uh, maybe placing some limits on the government's ability to support uh, or promote or advance religion. So uh, let's talk a little bit about what the doctrine is. Uh, for uh, that the Supreme Court has used under the Establishment Clause. How has the, the Supreme Court applied the Establishment Clause to controversies involving government support of religion? Uh, it's a very complicated area of law. There are lots of cases uh, ever, uh, over the years, beginning in, in, in the 1940s. Uh, I'm not going to talk about all those cases, of course. I'm going to try to simplify it, though, so, so, so it makes sense. And what I want to do is talk about two periods uh, in the Supreme Court history. First, I want to talk about the, the Establishment Clause at its kind of its height during the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, that was a period where the Supreme Court did, in fact, place some limits on government support for religion, the 80s, basically. And then I want to talk about the more contemporary period, which I'd say is sort of the 1990s through 2021, uh, where the Supreme Court has really eviscerated uh, this, the Establishment Clause quite a bit, and that will take us right up to October 2021 and then talk about the cases that were decided in this most recent term. So, in 1971, the Supreme Court decided this case called Lemon, Lemon versus Kurtzman. And in that case, it announced this test for evaluating government action under the Establishment Clause. It basically said for a government action to be constitutional, it has to have a predominantly secular purpose and it cannot have the primary effect of advancing religion. So, uh, in other words, if the government enacted a law, and that law was either predominantly motivated by religion, by a religious purpose, or if the law had the primary effect of promoting religion, then supposedly the, the, the law was unconstitutional under the Supreme Court's approach to the establishment clause. Religious purpose we can sort of put aside uh, for, for, for most of the time because the court only very rarely found that, that a law was unconstitutional because it was animated by a religious purpose. A handful of cases in which it did so, usually involving the public schools, like the two evolution cases that the court decided uh, were decided on religious purpose grounds. And then there was one case, uh, which I'd love to describe uh, to my students, where uh, there was a case in Alabama where there was a moment of silence law that was already in, in Alabama law. It said that, uh, that each day should start off with a moment of silence for meditation, or uh, I think it said just for meditation. And then Al the Alabama legislature wanted to just add the words or prayer uh, to, the, to, the, to the statute that authorized the, 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 the moment of silence. And they were sued, and at trial, the, the legislator who was in charge said, who, who, who proposed the statute said, uh, the reason why I enacted the statute is to promote religion. And, um, and, uh, and then the, 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 the lawyer said, uh, was there any other reason? And the guy said, no, that was the only reason. So with a record like that, it was easy for the court to say that's unconstitutional under the religious purpose clause, a uh, religious purpose test. But that kind of thing is rare. So usually, the cases have turned on religious effect. Is there a, is the effect uh, to promote religion? But by itself, this effects test has always been too vague to apply straightforwardly. Um, uh, I mean, what does the word advance mean? To advance the effect to advance religion. Uh, what does that mean in the different contexts in which cases come up at the Supreme Court? And so what the court did is it applied it differently in different contexts. So in other words, this, the Lemon test, which was the general test, no secular, it has to have a secular purpose, no religious effect. 
had different manifestations in different areas of controversy. Um, so, for example, there, I like to talk about the three main types of controversies that have made to the court that are most, the most common and the most divisive. Government funding of religion, where the government pays, uh, uh, sends money that ends up in religious uh, coffers, for example. Second, government-sponsored religious displays and symbols, like uh, a cross on, the, on public property, for example. And then third, government-led or, or government-sponsored prayer, either in a public school or in a legislative session or meeting, like starting off uh, uh, as the House and Senate do, the U.S. House and Senate does every day with a prayer. Let's think about that for a second. Okay. Um, so, so, one, so what I want to do is just talk about how the Supreme Court has applied Lemon's effects test to these three types of controversies. Government funding, go uh, religion, public displays of religion, and government prayer, or government-sponsored prayer. And I want to talk about those and how, they ch how the law changed from the early 70s and 80s, the early year in the 70s and 80s, to the modern year of the last 25 years, to kind of set the stage for what just happened this past year. So with money, public funding of religion, lots and lots of cases in the 70s and 80s, uh, and what the court did was it, it went into a really detailed inquiry into the nature of the funding and looked very carefully at whether it thought the funding was too much. And um, I can't go into it to it more than that. But, the, but basically, sometimes the court said funding of religion was okay. Sometimes the, the court said government funding of religion was not okay. Just as an example, the very first Supreme Court case about this kind of thing involved the New Jersey program which paid parents back for, uh, for sending their kids to school on a bus. So you took, you know, you send your kids to school on a bus, whether it's a public or private school, um, uh, the government would pay you back for the bus fare. And there was a challenge and said, this shouldn't go to, to, to parents who are sending their kids to religious schools, because that kind of supports religion. And, and the Supreme Court said, uh, it's okay, it's not really that big of a deal uh, to, to, to pay for the buses, to go to the, to the religious school, so it's okay. In other cases, it said, if they're going to, for example, if you're going to pay the, 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 the school back for sending, their, sending kids to a religious field trip, that's unconstitutional. So that's just an example of how the court sometimes said these funding programs were okay, sometimes said they were not okay. In the modern era, basically all government funding of religion is okay. Uh, as long as the money that the government provides is available kind of to all religions, all religious groups, alongside similarly situated secular organizations. So if the government wants to run a voucher program where it pays parents to send their kids to private schools, whether those private schools are religious or, or not religious, that's okay, even if that means that billions of dollars ends up going to religious schools. Uh, that is a result of a Cleveland case called Zellman, which I'm going to talk about a couple of times. So Zellman is the voucher case that says school vouchers are okay, uh, even if they include religious schools. Second, displays, public displays uh, of religion. In the, in the 80s, there were, the Supreme Court came up with this, case, this a doctrine called the endorsement test, the endorsement test. It was created by Justice O'Connor. And it basically said that the government can't put up a religious symbol on public property if it sends a message of, that the government is endorsing a religion, that it's saying that this particular religion is good and other religions are less, uh, are less important, something like that. And the court used it very occasionally to strike down religious symbols on public property, most notably in a case from Pennsylvania where uh, where County of Allegheny had placed a, a, a crash, a Christmas crash by itself on the, on the staircase of a courthouse. And the court said that's an unconstitutional endorsement of religion. In the modern era, the court has still, still used the endorsement test, but in a much weaker fashion. And a great example of that is a case from a few years ago when the Supreme Court said that a 40-foot cross on public property in Maryland uh, was not unconstitutional because it was just a monument to the, to the World War I dead, and it didn't actually say anything about religion. That is a case. I actually went to that uh, oral argument because I wanted to, I just couldn't believe that it was an issue. Um, but, but for 40 minutes, the justices debated whether a 40-foot, maybe it was an hour, they debated whether a 40-foot cross was a religious symbol or not. And I'm sitting there as a, sort of an atheist Jew thinking, what are we doing? Anyways, the court said it was okay. So, 
endorsement test, but much weaker than it is. And then finally, prayer. School prayer or prayer before a legislature or town meeting. The court has used uh, what's known as the coercion test So, in, in, for that, to decide if a, a public school kind of prayer situation might be coercive on non-believers, where a non-believer might feel, oh, I kind of participate in this prayer, or my friends and the teacher are going to think, you know, I'm a, I'm a bad person. Um, uh, so coercion was the manifestation of the lemon test with respect to the school prayer. And in the 70s and 80s, the court struck down, and in the 60s, court struck down a number of, uh, a number of uh, school prayer cases, uh, including a case where, where there was a, a rabbi gave, uh, gave an indication at a, at a graduation uh, in, 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 in Rhode Island. The court said that was too coercive. It made non-believers feel like they had to stand and participate in the prayer, and that was unconstitutional. In the modern era, the court has still used the coercion test, but in a much weaker fashion. Uh, so for a, a great example, that is a case called uh, Town of Greece from a few years ago, where the court upheld a practice uh, in this little town near Rochester, New York, where they would start every, every session off with a prayer. The argument was, if you're, you, you, know, you go to a board meeting to have your zoning variance voted on, and they begin the, with a prayer, Aren't you gonna, even if you don't believe in the prayer, stand up and participate in the prayer so that they grant your zoning variance? I think, of course. But the court said, no, that's not coercive. They're adults, they can leave the room. It's not, uh, not a big deal, not of course. So, so, so just to summarize, uh, public funding used to be sometimes the government could do it, sometimes they couldn't. Now they almost always can do it. Religious displays, the court used an endorsement test, struck down some displays. But not all. Now they still use, the, or in, up till 2021, they still use the endorsement test, but a much weaker version. And then with prayer, the court has used a coercion test that used to be strong and then became weaker over time. Okay, so at this point, I want to step back for a second and talk about the distinction between government support of religion and government preference for one or more religions and not others and over others because I think that's really important to understand what happened in the 21-22 term. When I say government support of religion, I just want to make it clear that for now, anyways, I'm including in the concept of religion those versions of secularism, uh, secular belief systems that take an active position on religious questions, that say, in fact, there is no God. I'm including uh, that as part of religion for purposes of this discussion because I think it's similarly situated to religion uh, because it uh, addresses some of the same questions that religion addresses. We can talk about that in a few may. It's complicated, but I think that's fair. In the early era the, that I was talking about, the court put significant limits on government support of religion, as I described. Some religious displays were not okay, some religious funding of religion was not okay, prayer might not be okay. Um, and, and it was also the case then, as it has been always, that the Supreme Court formally prohibits preference from any one religion over, um, over, over other religions. So the government can't uh, fund only Christian schools. If it's going to fund religious, school, religious schools, it has to fund all religious schools, um, uh, uh, Christian, Jewish, Muslim, and, et cetera. So the government can't prefer one religion over others. So in this early era, when the Establishment Clause really meant something, there were some limits on government support of religion and preferences for a particular religion are not allowed. In the modern era, meaning the last 25 years, basically there were almost no real limits on government support of religion. The last time the, government, the court struck down anything under the Establishment Clause was 2005. So if the government wants to fund religion or start off meetings of the prayer or devote public property to displays of religious symbols, it almost always can do it. And that's why in my non-Christian Mason book, the other book, no, sorry, uh, it, uh, I describe the state of affairs as, uh, as, as describing the United States as a post-separation nation. Because it's not really a separation of church and state, uh, um, even before the 21-22 term. The government can support religion in quite a bit. But the saving grace, uh, so to speak, I guess, um, of that situation was that the court's ban on preferring one religion over others was still in place. So there was still this anti-discrimination norm at work. 
So therefore, if the government wanted to start its, uh, its legislative session off uh, by inviting people to give a prayer, they had a, 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 a they had to invite not just Christians but other other religious leaders and, and, and secular leaders also. Um, if the government wanted to fund, say, religious uh, soup kitchen, it could fund it had to fund uh, soup kitchens of all denominations, not just Christian ones. If the government wanted to open up its its property to private religious displays, it had to open it up to all kinds of religious displays, whether Christian, Satanist, Jewish, anything. And so in my book, I described how minority religious groups have, from, from Wiccans to, to Muslims to atheists to the magnificent Satanic Temple in, in Salem, if you're familiar with them at all, um, uh, um, have, I described how they've taken advantage of this non-discrimination norm to participate alongside Christians in the public square. And I said, that's a good thing. It's sort of the best we can do uh, from the perspective of an atheist like myself. Um, it's the best thing we can do under the Supreme Court's doctrine. Okay, we're really close to the 21, 22 term of Christ. But uh, one more thing I want to talk about before that, which is this term theocracy, since I stuck it in the title. Um, I'm using this word very colloquially. I'm sure that there's a big literature that scholars have uh, gotten into about what the definition of theocracy is and what the conditions are that are necessary for theocracy and how, different, how there are differences among theocracies. I'm sure all that exists. I don't know it. Uh, uh, that's my sort of uh, downfall as a scholar. Is I, I just like, yeah, I don't know. No. Uh, um, I'm, I'm sure and someday I'll figure all, all that out. But for our purposes, what I'm talking about when I talk about stepping towards theocracy or skipping towards theocracy, I'm still wondering whether it should be tiptoeing or maybe uh, uh, or something else, sprinting maybe, I don't know. Um, my point here is that, uh, the main point is that for a theocracy to exist, no matter what it is, I think the government must be able, constitutionally, to both support religion and also to prefer its favorite religion over others. Um, that, and that's the way I'm using it. Um, if the government can support religion generally and also prefer one religion over others, that seems like it's getting pretty close to a theocracy, or at least the conditions of theocracy to me. But uh, this is the least sort of thought out uh, part, of the, uh, part of the talk. But the question is, are we there yet? And as of the beginning of the 2021 term, I would have said no. And I might still say no now, but it's much less clear today than it was about a year ago, which then brings us to the 21-22 term. Uh, there were four cases dealing directly with religion during this last term. Uh, and that doesn't, does not include cases where religion is playing kind of a big role behind the scenes or, uh, or, or, or you know, in the facts of the issue, like, the facts of the case, like in the Dobbs decision, obviously religion is incredibly relevant to the, to the abortion uh, debate. But what I'm talking about are cases in which the court dealt with the doctrinal issues involving the Establishment Clause or the Free Exercise Clause or one of those statutes that protects religion. And there are four of those. And I want to talk about them uh, in chronological order, which also is roughly the order of importance of the cases. With the biggest case, uh, which you may have heard of, the, oh, the Bremerton football prayer case uh, at the end. So the first case to talk about is Ramirez versus Collier. Ramirez versus Collier, which was de decided in March. Uh, and it was, this is sort of on the free exercise clause of things rather than the establishment clause side, but it's still relevant in one important respect. This is a death penalty case where the defendant asked to have his pastor present in the death chamber and lay hands on him and pray over him while the execution took place. Texas refused to allow the, the laying hands in the prayer part. Like they, let the, they would let the pastor in, but not, uh, but not let the pastor lay hands or say a, a, an out loud prayer yeah, in the execution chamber. And the defendant sued, not under the Constitution, but under the statute of Arlupa. Under that statute, in the prison context, the government cannot substantially burden one's religious practice unless it has a compelling reason to do so, and the means that it chooses is basically absolutely necessary to, to accomplish that goal. And the court held A to 1 in favor of the defendant, A to 1 in favor of the defendant, only Thomas dissented. 
Um, now, the decision, in my view, is rightly, rightly decided um, because I think the government did not show that, that, that a total ban on prayer or touching the defendant was necessary to its compelling goal of ensuring, supposedly compelling goal, of ensuring that the, the execution went smoothly. Like, that's what the state, you know, the state didn't want the, the pastor to be talking and praying uh, because there could be some mistake as a result and the execution could be botched. But there was, the government put forward no evidence to show that the prayer or the laying on hands was gonna do that. But there's one part of the decision that's particularly problematic. There's a section in, this, in Chief Justice Roberts' opinion which goes into some detail about the rich, this is a quote, rich history of clerical prayers at the time of execution in the United States. And he goes, through and he surveys the history back in the, in the UK and then the colonies and in World War II to show that there's been this history of prayer at the site of executions. Um, and that was completely unnecessary to the court's decision that this particular prayer was not going to interfere or dis disrupt the execution. That just turned on whether the government had shown whether shown that there would be an effect. It had nothing to do with history. And so when I first read that part of the opinion, I was like, what is this doing here? And the key, it turns out, is Justice Kavanaugh's concurrence. Kavanaugh, it seems like, insisted that this go with the majority of thinking about that, because he makes the separate point that for him, the history was critical to his decision. He says that he recognized the state's interest in, 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 in having the execution go forward in a smooth fashion, but concluded, quote, the history generally demonstrates that religious advisors have often been present at executions. And so therefore, the governments uh, didn't need to ban, ban the, the prayer. From the perspective of whether the government can prefer one religion over another, this focus on history and tradition is highly problematic, right? Because of course, the history is going to you know, favor majority religions. Right, so there's a history of, of Christian prayer and executions. But what if, say, Satanists came forward? I, I, mean, I don't know if Satanists would do wants, would, might want to do uh, at their execution, but say they wanted um, you know, an advisor, a, a religious advisor, to make the, the sign of a pentagram over her or something like that. Or, or maybe some, maybe some religion, religious, uh, minority religious group wants to, wants to burn you know, some, something in the execution chamber, you know, a sage or something. I don't know. Um, there's not going to be any history of that, right, uh, in, in executions of the United States, probably. Or it's much less likely that there's going to be a history uh, of that at executions than Christian prayer. And so, and so this like, focus on history and tradition, which is, goes throughout the Supreme Court's 20, 20, 21 22 term in Dobbs and various other cases, and, folk, and comes up here, is pretty dangerous from the perspective of for the government's ability to prefer historically favored religions. Okay, so that's that, the first case. The second case is called Shirtliff versus City of Boston. So it's right from here. It's decided in May 2022. Uh, it involves the city, uh, the city hall in Boston. There were three flag, well, there are three flagpoles in City Hall. One has the United States flag, one has the state flag, and one has the city flag. The city sometimes lets a private group put their flag up instead of the city flag. Um, usually, there are flags of other countries that go up in connection with a sort of a cultural event uh, involving that country. Sometimes, the, uh, they, the, the flag, a flag goes up for a group or a cause, like Pride Week uh, was an example. A Christian group called Camp Constitution came, and they said, we want to fly a Christian flag in connection with a Christian event on, uh, uh, on, the, in, on City Hall Plaza. Uh, and the city said no, because they thought it might violate the establishment clause to put up a Christian flag in front of the city hall. The city sued because, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, the guy sued saying that violated his free speech rights. And the case turned on whether these three flags, or really the third flag, was the city speaking or whether it was the private group speaking. Um, if it's the government speaking, when the government puts up the flag, then the government can do whatever it wants. It can say whatever it wants, um, basically. And it can decide, we're not going to say, we're not going to put up a Christian uh, flag because we don't, we don't want to. Um, but if it's private speech, if the flag is private speech, 
Uh, and what the government has done is basically opened up a public forum for private speech by saying, hey, you know, if you want, you can come in here and put up a private flag. Um, if that's what that flag is about, then the government will lose because the, 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 the doctrine of the Supreme Court says that the government cannot discriminate on the basis of viewpoint when it opens up a public forum for speech. It can, it can, just, it can set the subject matter of speech, but it can't, once it says this, can, uh, this, is a, this is a public forum for speech about religion, it can't then say some religion can go up and other religions can't. Um, and so everything depended on whether the flag is government speech or private speech. And the court said, um, uh, the court held for the private individual there and against the city. And um, it's a close case. I, I actually think the court was right. It was a unanimous decision. Uh, but, but what's interesting is not the decision itself, but a couple of things that are related to the decision that I want to mention. One of them is that in a, in a concurrence, Justice Gorsuch foreshadowed the later football decision by critiquing the lemon test and the endorsement manifestation of the lemon test. And arguing that historical practice, rather than endorsement or religious purpose or advancement of a religious effect, should guide the court's religion clause analysis. We'll come back to that in the, in the Washington case. The second issue is directly related to the, the interests of atheists and secularists. It doesn't come from this opinion directly, but it's come up in federal appellate courts uh, cases, and I fear it's going to come to the Supreme Court at some point during the Thomas Court. And the question is, can the government create a public forum open to religious expression and exclude atheist expression on the grounds that atheist expression is not religious? and therefore outside the subject matter limits of the form. Um, so that's complicated. I don't, I don't know how much it makes sense. We can talk about it in the, in the q and if, if you'd like to. But here's an example that gives me pause. Several times in the context of legislative prayer, including at the United States House of Representatives, um, right, where, where a government invites private individuals to start the day off with a prayer. Um, in those cases, it's clear that the government, if the government's going to invite a religious, religious individuals to come, say, they give a guest invitation or just to give the invitation generally, it has to open it to all religions. This is as a result of something the court said in the Tower of Greece case that I mentioned earlier. And it's the reason why we see all sorts of secular invocations and Satanist invocations, wicked invocations all over the country in the last seven years. But in the House of Representatives and a couple other jurisdictions, those places have said, yes, they have to be open, this, this pro invocation program has to be all open to all religions, but atheism is not a religion. And so the government can say, all religions can come and get their, their invocation, but not an atheist invocation. And some courts, two important courts, the DC Circuit Court of Appeals, and I think the Sixth Circuit, or the Third Circuit Court of Appeals, have said that's right. And so the government can, can kick atheists out of the invocation program because they are not religion. And I think that's a tr actually a travesty. Um, in, in terms of whether something uh, is, should be allowed into a public forum, uh, I think that atheism is, is similarly situated to, other, to, to all kinds of religion because it, it addresses and answers, or tries to answer, the same questions. Um, but the courts haven't seen it that way, and I think, I fear that the Supreme Court would do the same thing. It would say that it's okay for the government to exclude atheists and secularists from, from being invited or allowed to give the invocation at government meetings because atheists uh, don't pray. They, they, they aren't religious, and that's troubling from the religious, from the preference perspective that I was talking about before. It allows the government to prefer religion, or traditional religions and minority religions all over atheists and secularists. Third case is called Carson versus Macon from June 2022. Uh, this involved a state educational program from Maine. Maine is so lightly populated that some towns and districts don't have public high schools. So the state created this program where parents could choose to send their kids to a secondary school outside the district, public or private, and Maine will pay the district or the school to defray the costs, right? So if I'm in some little town in Maine and I don't have a high school in my town, I can send my, uh, you know, my kid to uh, the Bangor, a Bangor private school 
And then the, the state of Maine will reimburse that private, the Bangor school district, or not the school district, the Bangor private school for the money that it, that it costs to, to educate. There are some restrictions and conditions on what private schools can participate in the program, like they have to be accredited, they have to have a course of means history, which is interesting. But the other, the more important uh, limit is they could not be religious in order to participate in the program. And the parents who wanted to send their kid in a, 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 to a Christian private school sued and saying exclusion of religious schools from this program violated the free exercise clause by discriminating against religion. And the court held six to three for the plaintiffs in a clear, the clear conservative liberal type of split that we're going to see a hundred times in the next three years. Now, given the court's prior decisions, given the court's prior decisions, I think the decision was probably right. The court has held, for example, in the zoning case that I said talked about earlier, that including religious schools and voucher programs does not violate the establishment clause. And then in a later case called Espinoza, it said that excluding religious schools from a voucher program violates the free exercise clause. So this case followed pretty care, pretty straightforwardly from the cases that already had been issued. But those cases, I think, are, are deeply problematic. And so this Carson case completes this area of, of problematic law. And it's problematic from the perspective, once again, of the government's ability to prefer some religions over others. And I just want to explain briefly why that is. Remember I said earlier that the saving grace of the court's cases along support of religion is the, that the, is the ban on preferring one religion over others, right? So I'd rather the government not be able to support religion. But if it can't support religion, at least it has to, you know, when it supports religion, it has to allow an opportunity for all religions to participate in whatever the program is. But that only works in contexts where minority religions and secularists can, in fact, participate alongside Christians to a reasonable extent. So with legislative prayer, I think, you know, so anybody can give a two-minute prayer, uh, holiday display, um, you know, you can, the atheists put up their, their, their atheist displays next to Christian displays, Satanists do the same. There's a whole issue about after school clubs because there's a big set of Christian after school clubs. And you know, Muslims have also created after school clubs. The Satanists have created the after school Satan program. Ass, you may be familiar with. So those things, you know, that, 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 but creating an entire school to participate in a voucher program, that's categorically different to me. I mean, what religions are big enough and rich enough to create full schools that can then participate in a voucher program? Not many. There are Muslim schools, there are Jewish schools, but you know, I mean, I'd love a Satanist school, I'd love an atheist school, and maybe that would be an atheist school. And by atheist school, I mean a school that actually, right, an atheist school, which really doesn't exist as far as I know, right? So, so the, the Christians would say that they're, they're, all schools are, public schools are atheist schools, right? Because they teach things that they believe are inconsistent with their beliefs. But a, a true atheist school would actually teach that religion is wrong, right? So and you can imagine that, right? And, and so then that kind of school would have to be funded in the voucher program. But I don't think that there's, there's, that there's going to be an atheist school. It's more likely than a Satanist school, maybe. But in any event, maybe there's going to be one or two, right? And there are hundreds, thousands of Christian schools. Um, so, um, so, as a result, this rule that allows the support of schools, of religious schools, itself feeds into, kind of indirectly, but importantly, into the government's ability, once again, to prefer the majority religion, in this case, Christianity. And then finally, we get to the football case. And then I'll stop. Um, Kennedy versus Bremerton School District, from, and it was decided at the very end of June. Um, this is the, the case uh, uh, of a Washington football coach who led prayers uh, after football games. Now, the facts are very complicated, and they're also contested, um, so I don't want to spend that much time on them. Uh, basically, what, what I like, you know, the way I put it is that the football coach was forced, uh, was fired, I'm sorry, by the school district for his religious activity at the game. According to the, the defendants, you know, according, or according, I'm sorry, to, um, to, the, to, 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 the, to the guy, the coach, and according to the court's majority, the activity at issue was basically 
the coach kneeling for a quick, quiet prayer at the 50-yard line after games. According to the challengers and the dissenters of the Supreme Court, I gotta do, finish this before the ice cream melts, right? Um, <laughs> Oh, um, he was fired not for just making a, a quiet prayer after the game, but for a whole package of stuff, including leading prayers in the in the locker room, leading prayers at the 50-yard line, and both teams kneeling around him. Um, Justice Sotomayor included these pictures in her opinion, which shows the coach, you know, holding a, foot, a, a football helmet and praying with like 50 kids around it. Um, um, and making a big show in the media about how he was being persecuted for, for, for praying, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a big difference in the facts and how the different sides of you the facts. The district's rationale for firing the coach was that if it didn't fire the coach, the government would be seen as endorsing religion and thus violating the Lenin test and the endorsement manifestation, manifestation of the Lenin test. And also would be seen as coercing students into praying because. You know, what football player is going to want to, you know, you, you, know the, you don't believe in the prayer, but the coach is praying, everyone else is praying, you're going to be like, boy, I sure want to start on some Saturday or whatever, I guess I'll pray, right? I mean, but the, so, so, so that's why the, the school fired the coach. The court, of course, held for the coach six to three. Um, and it did a few things, three things that were problematic. It did manipulate the facts, I think. I, I don't have time to talk about that. I think it also used a very weak coercion analysis, uh, even weaker maybe than it, the court had used before. But most importantly, for our, my purposes here, our purposes, it discarded the lemon test and the endorsement offshoot of the lemon test. So finally, Justice Gorsuch, who wrote the opinion, got his way. And he replaced, it seems, seems to replace this lemon test and the endorsement test with, quote, reference to historical practices and understandings, original meaning and history, which means um, that the government, uh, that, that the court has opened the door to government preference of Christianity in several ways as a result of getting rid of the Lemon Test and the endorsement test. First of all, the court seems to have gotten rid of the religious purpose test, right? When it gets rid of Lemon, it gets rid of the religious purpose test. So, that means the government can engage in actions that have a religious purpose. And what purpose is the government likely to have, it, right, uh, it, 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 when, it's, when it's doing something for religious reasons? A satanic purpose? No, of course, it's a Christian purpose that's going to animate policy. Secondly, it seems that there's no limits on government setting up religious displays or symbols on its property anymore. There weren't many limits before, but now it seems like the government can probably set up religious symbols on public property whenever it wants. Uh, and what religious symbols is the government going to put up? Again, uh, probably Christian symbols. And then finally, this focus once again on a historical approach and measuring the establishment clause by reference to what has been occur what has occurred historically and traditionally inherently allows the government to favor the majority religion. So if you put all that together, I think you can see that as a result of this last term, we're getting closer and closer to a society that can not only support religion generally, but also prefer a specific religion, the majority religion, Christianity. And however you define theocracy, I think it's clear we're getting closer and closer every term that the Thomas Court continues in power to those the conditions uh, for theocracy. So that's uh, and now in there with that depressing note. Thank you. <laughs> Right, okay. okay, so yeah, now we have the Q&A. So uh, yeah, if you have any questions for Professor Webster, I guess you can just raise your hand and uh, ask. Yeah, please still this microphone. Okay, let's go. Uh, oh yeah, you can ask using the microphone. It's it's good. Good. It's good. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> you can't end it on like a depressing note, I guess. Uh -huh. But I guess I was curious, are there any cases that might be up and coming that could, that the decision could go in a way that could lead to even more of this theocracy crowd you were talking about. Are there any more? <laughs> you wanted more depressing. Okay. <laughs> um, so what I'm worried about is really the school prayer cases. Um, yeah, so the, 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 um, there were two cases in the 60s. Uh, one was called Engel and one was called Shem. And those are the cases that staff, uh, established the, the rule that the government can't we, that, that it's unconstitutional to have a government sponsored or led prayer in the classroom or elsewhere in the public school. And the rationale is this coercion idea, 
right? The, the, the teacher starts the prayer off in the, in the, in, at the front of the class, and if you if somebody who doesn't believe in the prayer, I mean, they're, they're going to feel like they're kind of pressured into giving them the prayer. I mean, they can ask to leave, but what eight-year-old is like? I want to. I mean, some, some do actually, right? I mean, um, but 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 it's but a, a lot of eight-year-olds are just going to. Just sort of mouth the prayer, um, feel like they're mouthing the prayer, you know, want to mouth the prayer rather than object. And the Supreme Court said that's kind of thing, you know, is, is unconstitutional because it coerces, coerces kids, young, impressionable kids, into participating in the prayer. And I worry that though that that you know, could be, uh, that could be at stake. Uh, and if, you know, another school prayer case comes to this Supreme Court, I think the Supreme Court might very easily say, uh, you know, sort of look at like the football case and say, kids, we said kids can resist coercion in the football context. Why weren't they be able to resist coercion in the, in the school context? You know, maybe the first case would be about high schools and then later it could be about, so that, I'm worried about that. Um, there's not that much left of the establishment clause to be worried about. <laughs> it's, um, so, uh, so, but there is that. Um, the other cases that, that, you know, are still in the books are, are curriculum cases, like the two, the, there are two evolution cases uh, from the 60s, and one in the 60s, one in the 80s, cases where uh, states said either if you're going to teach evolution, then you have to teach uh, creationism as a, or the first case was you can't teach evolution in the public schools. And the second case was, if you're going to teach evolution, you have to give uh, equal time to creation science, which is, I think, is there a division here in MIT? I don't know. Uh, so, so um, uh, and those cases turned on religious purpose, and I don't know if this court would, you know, would come up the same way on those, those uh, kinds of cases either. So, so it's it's uh, the government ability to support religion is just getting greater and greater. And I, I uh, with this court, I don't see it going. I mean, Justice Thomas, Justice Thomas's position is that the Establishment Clause doesn't limit states' authority to promote religion at all. He he reads the Establishment Clause right. So the clause says the Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion. Blah blah blah. And his view is that that basically, we, we, uh, all that was meant to do is to prohibit Congress from interfering with state establishments of religion, of which you know, there were many at the time of the founding, right? So, and so far he hasn't gotten anybody to go along with it, but, but uh, it's his court, and who knows? Um, so there, there's some more depressing things for you. Uh, uh, sure. Yeah. Um, hi, thanks so much for coming. I'm a little out of place as a Harvard student and an observant too, um, but I'm glad to be here anyway. Um, I'm curious about when, the, this is my area of focus in my studies, um, and one thing that we talked about in one of my classes today actually was about uh, days off in school uh -huh. um, for religious holidays, and how technically there's actually no religious language in the statutes that permit that. It just says, like, if the plurality of teachers and students are unavailable to come to school, then that day will be off. And then what days are those? Well, depends on where you are. Maybe it's breakfast days or the shana, whatever it is. Um, and so I'm curious if, if that poses a problem to you, how you feel about that, especially um, when you're talking about us becoming a theocracy because there are these Christian views that are being imposed from the government. If 65 to 75% of Americans are Christian, and the thing and, and, and the reasons for some things that we on the books is like convenience of a number of people in school, um, abortion, for example, like if people's beliefs come from their religious tradition, but then they're you know, they're voting, for example, like mm -hmm. that's a, that's to me like a secular democracy. I'm wondering how you kind of balance the demographic and logistical issues with also the fact that they're inspired by by Christianity. Yeah, that's a great question. And those, those cases are really interesting. Um, and I haven't looked in there for a while. I know there's one really interesting case of a Good Friday. Did you read the Good Friday case? You mean that, that Judge Posner in the seventh, who's a, uh, uh, a um, controversial but a great writer, has a, uh, has a, a great case about striking down Good Friday in Illinois um, because, it, because I think it was written in Christian terms, right? But so, 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 
schools now know that the way to do this is to, is to say that there's no school day on days where, right, I mean, if you hold school on Christmas, uh, you know, um, you know, there are not that many people are going to show up. And and, it, and I, I'm not such a safe separationist that I would say, oh, that's, um, that I don't think that should be allowed. Um, there's, you know, some practicalities in that, that, um, that, I, that, that makes sense. Um, on the other hand, it is true that, uh, that, 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 that it's the same kind of, kind of phenomenon uh, that where which, which days are going to be off in most places are going to be the Christian holidays. Uh, and then there are going to be cases where it's close, right? Where 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 the where somebody's got to decide, uh, you know, on this Jewish holiday there will be enough people out that we should, you know, that it's going to qualify. But on this uh, you know, on, uh, on this Hindu holiday, it is not, and and that is going to tend to 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 promote um, uh, the majority religions or the minority ones. Um, so that uh, that's you know that's one of those places where I think. The court need it's really hard, um, and a lot of these issues are really hard, um, uh, and and that's why um, when the court used to use these tests that were that that were criticized as not being legal because they didn't have these rules, but were using but were like balancing tests where the court was supposed to exercise its judgment. You know, how much money to religion is too much. Um, how many, you know, this question to you, how many, uh, you know, sh should, sh should there be a day off for, for this particular religion or that particular religion? Some of these issues require, because there are these competing interests on both sides, a, a sort of subtle exercise of judgment. And Justice O'Connor was the paradigm of that. Um, and every year I miss her more. Like, I wasn't a, a huge O'Connor fan when I was in law school. But but she but but her approach was that you know these are hard questions and the court can balance and then you had Justice Scalia and other people like Justice Scalia who were like rules 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 and the that's the majority of the court does now and so it's like all funding is fine no uh, all endorsements are okay, final and so I don't know what the Supreme Court will do if it ever hears one of these cases and I'm not sure whether I'm addressing your question but but I I just think that that I would acknowledge that that set of issues is difficult and there are interests on both sides and we need to have sort of reasonable judgment based solutions and whatever the doctrine is has to recognize that and I fear that the court is not going in that direction at all so I guess those are my uh, my thoughts on that I haven't thought about that that specific issue of religious holidays for a while so this is not at the top of my head but it is um, uh, in Good Friday in Hawaii was once was it's interesting in that Good Friday case Good Friday in Hawaii was was they gave Good Friday off but it was part of a, uh, a sort of a, uh, a, a secular consumer holiday they made it into um, and so it made, so he used that as an example of what of how you could have a Good Friday office for secular reasons, but not for this is very interesting. Okay, sorry. I think that's that's the best I could do. Um, I don't know if you oh, sorry. No. Okay. I don't know if you mentioned this one earlier, but I'm wondering if um, when you talk about like this credit regime and Supreme Court decisions, if you think that that not getting the text is all of them before it's very Oh, so um, so does the court think it's like doing this neutral kind of thing of talking about history as a way of interpreting the Constitution and just oh, it just happens to <laughs> promote? Or are they saying, or are the justices saying, we want to find a way to 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 actually allow flourishing government supported Christianity, and so we're going to implement this test kind of thing? Is that like going into the minds of the justices, sort of? Well, I guess I'm curious about like if. This is a problem. Would the decision have to be to overturn like decisions that have been made in the past and to find like new ways without relying on like previous court decisions, or is the solution just to like um, appoint justices who are more neutral in their approach to the Uh yeah, I just I think I mean 
I think there has to be. I don't think this court, the people who are on this court, are going to change direction. So, and I and I think in order for the this area of law to go back to something more palatable to someone like me, um, we're going to need new justices, and they're going to need to. I mean, it's always a question of can the justices work within the within the framework of the cases that exist. And, and, and sort of come to some different conclusions, or do they have to, on the other hand, overrule earlier decisions? And that, that, um, that's hard to tell so far. Like, I think, I think you know, the, 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 the court in the, in the football case did not say, we formally overrule Lemon and the endorsement test. It didn't do that. It said something like, we have long discarded the lemon test and it's endorsed or something like that. And, and, and to the extent it does that, a new, you know, new justices can come in and say, actually what we said there was not quite right. And in fact, we have applied the lemon test or the endorsement test many times. Um, but it's getting to this court saying, you know, uh, coming up with clear affirmative rules that will, that will, support religion, in which case the, the, the justice would have to. I, so I think at this moment, the court can, uh, new justice can still work within the framework of these cases to go back to something more sensible. Um, but it's it's getting harder and harder, and uh, and, it, and and it might, that, that it might change you know, where they would actually have to go and overrule the cases, I think. Thank you. Yes, I would ask like, what is kind of in your view what's the way that we should go forward like should we advocate for like packing the courts should we just like wait decades until the time works out <laughs> yeah I, that's such a hard question i mean i've been resistant to the packing the courts idea but um you know it's just it's hard i, I think but again I'm getting more what can we do? I mean, I, you know, it's just, it's, um, we, if we wait, um, the things are just going to get worse and worse. I, I can't even imagine where they might go. Uh, not just in the religion context, but, but elsewhere. Um, if you have the court, it's really a political. So, so my problem with this is that I, I guess I don't feel confident to, uh, to, to about the, the political ramifications. Um, you know, the argument that if we pack the court then and we lose and then Democrats lose, then the Republicans have pack the court back. And that doesn't seem right. Um, but on the other hand, you know, um, there's no, I don't know if there's a, another way. I, there's one possibility is jurisdiction stripping. Like, so, so Congress can, um, it's, it's a little, it's, it's tricky and, and jurisdiction away from the federal courts over certain issues. Uh, conservatives tried to do that in earlier years. Um, they tried to take a juris, a court, federal court jurisdiction uh, uh, um, uh, from flag burning cases and, and school prayer cases. And it, they could maybe, that, that might be a constitutional, that might be constitutional uh, because the, the courts are a creature of Congress. Um, and, and there are arguments on both sides of that, but I think it's plausible. And so that's one thing that maybe uh, might be sort of short of the re redoing the court, repacking the court that maybe Congress could do. I know that some people in that um, in that you know commission, which was silly as it turned out to be silly, the commission to study options and what to do with the court. I know that some of those uh, folks kind of were like the, the idea of jurisdiction stripping or jurisdiction limiting. Uh, as a, as kind of a solution to what's going on, but but um, I don't know if there's any will in Congress to do that. Uh, so so it's a real conundrum. I I, I, I do not know what, to, what what I would do if I was uh, uh, advising someone. Um, but I, but it, it's getting really uh, a desperate situation for people on the left who believe in rights. I, I, I mean, when the third action is overturned next, you know, in the fall. Uh, and, 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 and then I mean, it's going to get harder and harder to use this thing. Uh, oh, I definitely. So we also have a couple of questions uh, from the live stream. Oh, so, hello, uh, live streamers. 
I will uh, I'll leave them out. So um, Kevin Greenman has asked some research, for example, the human flourishing program at Harvard has shown that participation in religious communities can be beneficial to individuals in terms of mental health, happiness, etc. Even when controlling for confounding factors. Does it follow that in support of the common good, the government should be able to financially support religious practice as long as it doesn't show a preference for one religion over another? No, that's a that's a that's a good question. If, right, so if there were uh, so I don't know the data, but the data showed that participation in religious communities had all these benefits. Well, could could the government justify promotion of religion uh, on those kinds? I, uh, you know, I don't think so because I think that the Constitution prohibits uh, that most of that kind of support. Um, uh, but you know, I think it should be part of the conversation. I I, I also think that that. It, um, I'd be interested to see if that what that research says about about uh, the, the the growing number of secular communities uh, and, and atheist communities that are you know substantive like this one right not, you know, groups that come together for a communal good even if it's not for religion but for uh, for, for for social justice or uh, or just supporting each other's uh, beliefs uh, together. I think that's something atheists and secularists have not really done as much as as as, as we could. Um, I, I was at a conference not so long ago. I was at the Secular Students so, uh, uh, not Association, it Association Alliance, yeah, so right? Yeah. Um, and and you know the big theme of that conference was a couple of years ago now was you know atheists can't just be people who are pointing and say religion is wrong and just you know uh, we need to be a community uh, as well and we provide help to people who need and and I think. Um, so I think that I would be curious if, if, if the research shows that it's just religious organizations or if it's, it might be for all kinds of organizations with a common purpose provide these benefits and that it's not really necessary that it be religious and you can have atheist community groups providing the same kinds of uh, benefits. That, that would be one question I would be uh, interested in. But, but, you know, I take the question, religion has, there are good I, I'm not somebody who is anti-religion, uh, uh, generally, and I think religion does uh, uh, undoubtedly have benefits, obviously, for millions of people, and, and it, we should recognize that. But I don't think that necessarily means that a doctrine should be different, um, because that, I think the harms of government-supported religion are significant uh, to religious minorities, and, uh, and, and, and that's primarily why I why I believe you should have a strong statute of Thank you. Uh, another question, also from Kevin Greenman. Uh, regarding the funding of Christian schools, what are your thoughts on the roots of the so-called green amendments in anti-immigration and anti Right. So, well, that's a, that, um, the, um, so, uh, so historical uh, to go back up a little. Um, there was the Blaine amendments uh, are meant are the, the little Blaine amendments because the, the big Blaine amendment, which was going to be at the uh, federal level, uh, didn't uh, fail. But these little Blaine amendments are parts of con uh, state constitutions that say um, that no money shall go to uh, in the hands of religion whatsoever, kind of thing. And they were clearly born out of anti-Catholic bigotry. Um, that, that, that's what the, those amendments were, were based in. Um, you know, there was a, there were lots of anti-Catholic uh, prejudice in, in U.S. history, and it led to riots and and, and being killed. And, and that's we have to recognize that that's an important, important part of U.S. history, and that uh, and that the attempt to sort of ban ban. Uh, public money from going into uh, religious hands is basically a way of uh, trying to ban Catholic schools uh, or public uh, or to to, to 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 harm the movement towards public uh, towards Catholic schools, um, and so that uh, that you know the history is problematic. I think the court's argument says that history is problematic. It doesn't mean that I think that that 
states can't or, or shouldn't still have constitutional provisions that ban money from going to religion. It just shouldn't be rooted in that anti-Catholic prejudice. It should be rooted in a concern for what government funding of religion uh, uh, ramifications are for, for religious minorities and non believers so, so I guess that's my answer. I, so I'm saying I agree that there was uh, anti-Catholic prejudice and those, uh, those amendments have a, 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 a definitely a troubled history, but that doesn't mean that states shouldn't be able to implement limits on government support of religion. And thank you, Professor Wexler, for uh, amazing talk tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.